Hello, everyone, and welcome to our episode today, which is going to be a lot of fun, uh, Deadly Lies and Female Spies. I am your host, Lee Bukowski. I am the author of the fiction novel, A Week of Warm Weather. Uh, so hopefully, you'll check that out. You can get that online anywhere books are sold. And I'm very excited about our episode today. Maybe People who know me maybe think I'm a little too excited about uh, the idea of female assassins and uh, these protagonists putting themselves in these very uh, dangerous situations. Um, so we are going to have a great conversation today. Um, I want to say first that um, if you are joining us live, you want to give uh, StreamYard permission to access your Facebook name. If you don't do that, you will just show up to us as Facebook user. And we want to be able to know who is joining us so we can hopefully uh, answer your questions. If you have a particular uh, question for one of the authors, you can certainly put that in the chat um, and we will, uh, you know, try to accommodate you as we are going along. So I'm very happy to introduce our panel today. And we are, uh, we're awaiting one more guest who uh, hopefully will show up and we'll see about that. So we have Josie Brown. So Josie is a novelist, a journalist, a playwright. You're the author of 39 novels. Come on, Josie. You're showing off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Including your Housewife Assassin's Handbook, which I just got the first one. And I'm, I read the first few pages and laughing my head off. So I know I'm going to love it. Uh, you have your Totlandia episodic series, your extracurricular series, which I'm about halfway through that. And it's fantastic. So I, I can vehemently uh, recommend that. Um, and your novel, Secret Lives of Husbands and Wives, was optioned for TV. So we'll talk about that. Very exciting. You are the, uh, your podcast called Author Provocateur. Um, and this is unconfirmed. Josie and I think we actually might be twins separated at birth. Now, we're not, we can't confirm that yet, but we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. So welcome, Josie. And thank you so much for assembling this wonderful panel today. Uh, so we're waiting. We're waiting for Lisa Barr. Well, hopefully she's going to be able to join us. We also have Jane Healy, the best-selling author of historical fiction. Um, oh, here comes Lisa. Let me let her in. Hi. Hi, Hi Lisa. So sorry. I've been having technical troubles, so thank you. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're just happy that you're here. We're happy you're here. Right. I'm just going to thank my daughter right here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would it, if it weren't for our kids, honestly, <laughs> and my kids get very frustrated with me. So then I have to remind them how long I was in labor with them and everything. And then, <laughs> then, they're, then they're usually pretty good about helping me. But no, no worries. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. We're just getting started and I'm introducing you ladies. So Jane, back to Jane, uh, who is the best-selling author of historical fiction, uh, the Saturday Evening Girls Club, the Beantown Girls. Your latest novel, which just came out in March of this year, Good Night from Paris. We're going to talk a lot about your novel. Um, and you also host Historical Happy Hour, which is a monthly webinar featuring uh, premier historical fiction authors and their work. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Jane, so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. And we have Yasmin Ongo, uh, who is an Anthony-nominated and first-generation Ghanaian-American author, and she has her Nina Knight series, um, which is, uh, and I, as we were talking earlier, like we're trying to avoid spoilers and, you know, I've ordered the, the first of each of your books. And so um, I'm, I always try to remember what to say, what not to say. We were talking a little bit about that. Um, but you, uh, so your debut, her name is Knight, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, listed as a Amazon's best book of the month, an editor's pick. And it's been optioned for TV. And the third book comes out in September. Uh, so congratulations on that. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And Lisa, you made it. You're the author of Fugitive Colors, The Unbreakables, and your most recent novel, Woman on Fire, which came out in March of 2022, which is a New York Times bestseller. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about your, your novel, all of your novels, actually. Um, with today's episode, but you are, you've been an editor at the Jerusalem Post, Today's Chicago Woman, and Moment Magazine, an editor reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times. And so obviously you're all very, very busy and successful and accomplished. And I am just humbled that you are able to join us today. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. 
So let's get to this. Female assassins. And and so we have uh, Josie and Yasmin with your female assassins, which I um, I love. Mm -hmm. And Lisa and Jane, you've got your, your characters who put themselves in these very, very secret and dangerous situations. So Josie, what, let's start with you. So you're trying to decide, what do I want to write, write about? And you know, I know, I'll write about a female assassin. Where does that come from? And does um, your husband sleep with one eye open? Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I uh, believe it or not, it was years after 9-11, um, but I was, um, I was in my living room and the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. And, and for some reason, what had happened in 9-11 had still affected me in my neighborhood because we actually had, you know, Air Force planes flying overhead. We, it was so quiet from no other airline traffic that it was kind of freaky for us. And I mean, I, I'm sure everybody was kind of traumatized by that when it happened. So I was thinking, what would a normal mom do in this kind of situation if she were placed, you know, in a situation where she knew there were terrorists and, 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 and that's the impetus of the book. And I actually got chills when I said it and I immediately called one of my critique partners and I said, what do you think of this? And she goes, write it. And wow. yeah, so it was kind of cool. And I, and I did write it and it, it, uh, it went to auction, which was nice. And, um, and then all of a sudden, all, all up and down the line, people were saying, nobody wants to read about a mom who's an assassin, which I thought was like, oh, okay. And of course now, you know, all over television, moms are assassins. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I kind of held that one. I kind of held that one back and I was writing other things. And then finally it, it got to the point where I said, I just have to put this out. And I did, and I'm glad I did because it's, it's been sort of my moneymaker for, you know, the brunt of my career, which is nice. And there's so many stories about, I mean, there's so many plot lines that I still have because the intelligence community, sadly, you know, will be us, with us forever as it has been, as you know, Jane writes about. And when Lisa did her dive into her book, she wrote about. And of course, Yasmin is just like all over this too. So she knows how, in, how it is, um, how we are all part of this and not part of this, but it's all around us. Interesting. So that was the, that was the impetus for the, the Housewife Assassin series. Right. Yes. Okay. And also for the first book, because it, I won't give away any spoilers, but, you know, there are people in her own neighborhood that she doesn't realize are assassins. So until she does, uh, you know, figures things out. So right. you'll see that. Okay. Amazing. Yasmin, how about you? So you you were and there there are connections, and we'll talk about that. Whether there are real life connections to, you know, maybe some of yourselves sneak into your characters. Um, but so Nina is she's stolen as a child from her home, correct? Yes. So how did this come about? Um, well, I was never stolen as a child from my home, um, but um, but That's yeah, like, just um, just similar to uh, to Josie, I just. Well, I, I just really like a character who is just not all, you know, doesn't have everything together. I like mm -hmm. them. I like my characters to have um, something that is kind of complex and hard to, you know, you're not supposed to like it. So right. I, I definitely wanted a female character that was strong, that was like everything that I felt like I wasn't. You know, she's very athletic and I'm allergic to exercise. And so I, I wanted that kind of person there. And I wanted her to have like this job or this, you know, be involved in this thing that people are just like, I'm not supposed to like this, but I totally root for this woman. And, and it was, and so the, the, um, the, the challenge that I gave myself is how do I get the reader to, to care about this person who gets paid to, to go out and kill people. And even though she kills with a code and, and everything like that, but, um, but she still does it and, and dealing with that, that um, question of, you know, what is justice and what is right mm -hmm. and wrong and, you know, what is vigilante and isn't, you know, compared to, you know, what everybody thinks. And so that is, mm -hmm. um, that is an argument that she has, you know, with her love interest and, and with herself. Um, and that's something that I also had, like, you know, do, do I knock someone who, who goes out and, 
you know, purposely goes and takes people down who are hurting other people? Or do I just stand by this, you know, black and white, this is bad, murder is bad kind of thing. Um, and so I just really wanted to, to create a character that I thought was just really unique and, and really just like wild and, um, and just so cool on so many yeah. levels, but also so very human um, and, and fractured and to show how she survived something while doing her job and being able to multitask and do all these things that women do, you know, in our everyday lives. We may not all be assassins or, you know, going and putting ourselves out in danger and things, but we do so many things. Um, and um, and I just wanted to kind of highlight that through an assassin. <laughs> it's so, you know, it is, it's very interesting. And I think people people love that. I know I love that. And you, you think of this kind of the anti-hero, you know, and I think people think of, you know, it's not just assassins. It's, it, it, it always comes to mind first to me, I think of Tony Soprano. Like, mm -hmm. We're not supposed to like him, and yet we do. And he's, he's a bad guy, and yet, you know, and so it's that, I love that, and we're gonna talk about how, what a talent it is to be able to put, have a character like that, who do these awful things, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and yet we like them, and we root for them. And so that's where you really get into their essence, and like, why are they doing it? And it, are they justified? And so that, that's really interesting, so. We'll, we'll, we're going to talk about all those things. It appears we may have lost Lisa again for a minute there, but we'll see. Hopefully, she can she can get back in. Jane, so your let's talk about your latest novel and all of your novels. We're going to talk about are based on real people and events um, and historical fiction. I'm just such an admirer of authors of historical fiction. Just we'll talk about the staggering amount of research and all that that goes into it. Um, but so your character in Goodnight from Paris. Uh, uh, Good night from Paris is she doesn't she's not a an assassin but she certainly puts herself in a very very dangerous position uh, with the French resistance so talk a little bit about you know how you how do you come up with these characters that that are in these very very you know secret and dangerous uh, situations. Yeah, so um, thank you for having me on. I'm honored to be on this panel. I came, I ended up writing Good Night from Paris because my my third novel, um, The Secret Stealers, was about the women of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA in World War II. And dur during my course of research for that, I came across this woman, Drew Leighton Tartier, who was a, a she was an American actress. She was pretty like a rising star in Hollywood, and she left it all behind for love and moved to Paris in the late 1930s. And so this is a departure for me because she was a real person and this novel is, is her life, is Drew Leighton Tartier, it's biographical fiction. Because her story was, was really almost stranger than fiction. She ended up kind of the first voice of America on the radio um, in Paris during the early, late, late 1930s to early 1940s. And, um, and she did such a good job on it that the Nazis threatened to execute her when they occupied the country. Nice. But then, so that was like her first brave choice. But then when France was occupied, she started getting involved in um, getting allied flyers out of the country through the underground network. So that was like another very brave, very dangerous choice that, um, you know, she didn't really have any experience in this. She was an actress. She didn't, she had a pretty posh lovely life before the war and then she was thrust into this role in this position and she thrived she actually you know she did an incredible job rescuing these you know british canadian and american flyers all over paris and, and all over france and getting them out of the country so so drew was a real person and i just um the more i learned about her the more i had to write about her and that's how i ended up writing the story so it is really her it's her biographical but fictional story. Yes, yes, it's very much um, true to her life. Um, I, you know, I, I always say I listened to a panel one time. Historical fiction authors, your your notes at the end are your best friend, and and this, I have about ten pages of notes at the end that kind of say where I had to take fictional leaps and and where I did not, and because I think and I think people would be surprised at how much of the book is true, mm -hmm. true to her life story. That it actually is true to her life story. Yes, yeah. um, and so. Let's talk a little bit, and Yasmin, you touched on this, and the rest of you um, can add to it. There's always this this question in novels like yours of, you know, what is too far, and and you know where, how do you straddle that, you know, pursuing justice, doing what you know is right, and and yet 
um, you know, that the hunt for either revenge or, or doing something illegal or criminal. Um, how do you how do you balance that? How do you get your how do you get your readers, I guess, you know, to buy in? Why do we like these women? I guess is the question, because we do. We love them. We champion them. So how do you you know, what's your method for for getting your readers to buy to buy into that? Yasmin, if you want you had started, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more. Sure. So even when I'm reading a book, I, I read not only for the story, but I read for the character. Like I really, really want to love the character and, and immerse myself in that character's experience. And so when I am reading a book and can relate to just anything from the character, then that gives them, you know, grace to me. Um, and I can even hate, you know, a character, but there might be, they might have a motivation that I can understand, you know, oh, their parents, something happened to their parents and this is why they turn this way. And I can understand that. And that, that gives me, you know, the ability to, to, I don't want to, I'm not going to root for them, but I root for something better for them. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, I'm invested in whatever it is that's going to happen to them, even though I know that they might get their comeuppance at the end. Um, and so I strive to write characters that, you know, readers can relate to in some sort of fashion, um, it, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be everything and they don't have to believe in what that character believes in. But there's something that makes that that character relatable that they can be like, I can understand that, I can get that. Oh man, this person is horrible, but you know they make sense in, in, about this or or something like that. And and so that's what I try to do. Yeah, and I, I think that's so true. I do that too. I think when there's some thread, even though these people are so flawed, because we're all flawed. Yeah. Right. So nobody's nobody's going to be interested in a character who's just perfect in every way. Yeah. But I think you're so right. If there's just one thing, I know readers have told me that even about my book, if there's even one thing that just resonates with them and they feel like they can connect to. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, you're not going to maybe love everything she does or, or but you're there, there's that connection like, oh, motivation is it's such a big part of it. Like, why do they do the things that they do? Right. Um, Josie, what do you have to say about that? Um, well, it's interesting. I, one of the things I enjoy doing is making my villains as, um, you know, they're, they're very, very bad, but also there's a thread of them that there might be something that you like about them or that you think you're going to like about them. And then they crush you and they, they're not the person that you thought they were. And, um, so that's always been fun for me. Um, my heroine, whose name is Donna, she has, um, uh, people know her backstory immediately because after they see her in action, the books always start off with a caper, but after, after they see her in action, they want, they see the vulnerability of her with her children and they see the fact, and now the books have spanned about five years of her life. And in that five years, you know, there's been several situations where her children have been in danger and there have been situations and not at her doing, you know, there are people who have put her children in danger. They're, her children do stupid things, like all of our children do stupid things, right? You know, so. Oh, mine don't. <laughs> oh, yes, Lee, I know. Yours are perfect. I got that. But um, so there, it's it's great for Donna to be both a mom and also to be um, someone who is just this side of having everything blow up around her. And by the way, her house has blown up once. So, so you know, it's, it's, she's been, but these books also have a, their, their humor. What I love is I love letters from the readers that tell me, Oh, that Mary, you know, one of the daughters, you know, how could she, have, you know, you know, cause the daughter's preteen going into teen. And then now she's at the point where she's graduating. So we, we've seen her go through all of her teen phases and at the same time, finding out what her parent, her mom really does. And the same thing with the other kids. So it's been fun to watch the trajectory. I think the family is just as important. It makes the story kind of deeper, but it also, they now know in, in the series, what she does and they comprehend why she does it. And it's not, it's not a easy thing to say to your children. And most right. people that are in, in the intelligence community don't tell their families what they do, or if their families figure it out, they don't acknowledge it. Uh, even after the fact, they don't do that. And there's a reason for that. And I, and I totally respect it. In this case, I'm writing fiction so I can play a little bit and I can have them, you know, put their families in danger, so. That, that is that's so interesting and the, bringing in the children and which really humanizes Donna 
Um, and that's something that, you know, people can instantly relate to. The humor is, it, I mean, you, it's just laugh out loud. I was reading extracurricular on the plane to Nashville last week and I'm sitting there laughing. I mean, your writing is so funny. I love, I just start when the, in the first um, uh, housewife assassin, I love the little tips in the beginning, you know, they're just very like, here's the way, you know, to drive the carpool. You want to be punctual. You want to be there. And then, you know, and this one will help you even when the children are saying how many people you've killed, like just fun little, <laughs> oh, by the way, kind of, uh, but I love that you're here. Books are so, so funny. Um, and I think that adds the relatability, you know, it's that you're writing fiction. So we're not really saying, hey, we really like assassins, you know, like, we, you know, it's just kind of like you tie it all together and make it so relatable. Well, thank you. And Jane, so you're um, again, we'll talk about Drew and even in your other novels, these are these are women. These are protagonists who just see a wrong that needs to be righted. Um, and so, again, even though they're you know, they're doing things that could be criminal or illegal or whatever. Um, so how, how do you do that? How do you create that character that we are we're going to root for her, even if she's maybe doing things she shouldn't be doing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it goes to what you, a lot of you, uh, what we were just discussing, what you all mentioned about the, like, finding the humanity in people, mm -hmm. and part of pe people's humanity is their flaws, and, and Drew was, um, she was a, look, she was a pretty successful actress, she was pretty arrogant, she was certainly not um, timid in any way, and, and that, and she used her um, looks to her advantage, um, particularly you know, she's tall and blonde. And so the Germans liked that. So when it when it worked to her advantage, she would use that. So there were, you know, there were things about her that um, she was, she was very complex. So it was, it was fun to write about her. It was challenging because she was a real person from history and I wanted to get it right. But, um, but it was really, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it because she was so complex and, 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 and a lot of the decisions she had to make were not black and white, they were gray, you know, um, right. you know, and so, it really this her life story really just lent itself to a novel this kind of cinematic yeah. story yeah and, and and i think that's true in most cases most things aren't black and white they're the yeah. it is that gray and that's the like you said the layering and the complexity of these characters um and so lisa is unfortunately she's she has people helping her but she's she can uh, unable to get uh back into the studio with us which is such a bummer but hopefully maybe they'll maybe they'll get that figured out and she can she can rejoin us. Um, so let, let's talk about these empowered female characters. So how do they how do they use their power to in, just, not just to impact the plot, but affect others, but at the same time, defining their own paths? Um, so how do you so Jane, why don't we start with you? And you can talk about Drew, or you can talk about any of your not any of the novels if you want. So how do they? How do the? How do you get these characters to define their own path, even as they're you know moving the plot along and and affecting others and affecting the plot of the book? Yeah, well, I think in Drew's case, you know, she she started with the radio show, and while and this is no spoiler because it happens pretty early on. Her she marries Jacques Tartier, the love of her life. He goes off to war, and he goes missing, and so. She's she's in Paris on her own. She's in France on her own. And she's and she says in articles later on in her life, she said, look, I had no recourse. It's not like I could sue someone because my husband was missing. Right. So I just felt like I, she felt compelled to do something. And that something ended up being working with the resistance. And I, and it kind of, you know, she was living she she was living outside of Paris for a while to kind of lie low during the war because she was afraid that she was going to be executed for her radio mm -hmm programming um and but that but at the same time when when allied flyers started you know get crashing all around her and all around the area that was where she thought like well i can't help my husband but i can help these men and i and i have and i have to do something to kind of to feel like i'm doing something good for, for the good of this of this cause while he's away I don't know if he's dead. I don't know if he's imprisoned. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was just, she had to take matters into her own hands, I think for her own sanity, frankly, because yeah. she was going crazy with the unknowns. And, um, and so that's, I mean, it was, a, she made some really brave, risky choices, but I think she, at the time and the play, she felt like she didn't, you know, it, it was the only thing she could do. She really just felt like she didn't have a choice. She was compelled to do this. And you can yeah. imagine that feeling 
she couldn't do anything about her husband. So right. this was something that she could do. Yes, exactly. Which is very powerful because, you know, many people don't, you know, they think, well, I can't do anything, so I'll do nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'll just go into my hole and, and be depressed and wait wait it out. But um, but yeah, no, she definitely took matters into her own hands, and right. um, you know, for the betterment of of a lot of um, you know, American, Canadian, British flyers. Right. So Josie, how about your? And again, you can we'll talk about your housewife assassin series. Um, how how does Donna sort of forge her own path? What drives her to do what she does? Um, when she was uh, delivering her third child, her husband uh, went off to get the, her, the baby bag that was left in the car, and he never came back. And it turns out that um, he was killed, a uh, car blew up, and she uh, finds this out after she delivers her child. So for five years, she's been kind of you know, holding that in. She found out when his boss came and told her, this is what happened. This is who he really was. This is what he was doing. He was, uh, you know, he was an associate with our group where black ops, blah, blah. And she was um, very, um, you know, very, you know, you go through all five stages of grief, right? And in, in her last stage, she kind of stuck in anger. And um, it turned out that because of her background, she actually was also uh, a really good shooter. That was how she connected with her father who was a, a, a drunk and their mo her mother had died when she was at the age of 10. Her mother was a perfect mom. So, you know, in her life, she always feels her, she feels she has to be a perfect mom. And so part, when somebody threatens her family, they show up at her house at night and she's able to, to wing them essentially she goes to um, her ex, uh, you know, her dead husband's boss and says, um, hey, um, I want to be, I want to take his place or I want to be part of what you're doing. And they allow her to do that. And they send her on missions. And, the, you know, it's all black ops. And it's always, she always has to, she tries very hard to be there for her children. So she tries to arrange it. So it's between carpools. And of course, she's <laughs> lives in a neighborhood where there's a ton of mean mommies. It's a very private, posh, neighborhood it was the last it was the house that her husband had bought for her and thought that they would all be safe you know so so it's one of those kind of situations where she's living the stool alive and through through that she the she has very she has very dark feelings because she's cut off a part of her that part of her soul that was always warm and giving except to her children right. and as it turns out what what kind of flips it is that you know five years later they have given um They've, they've decided, her, her, her um, employers have decided, we are pairing you with another operative. He's going to pretend to be your husband and who's, yeah. you know, come back. And of course, the kids are like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, he's been gone five years. You know, the, the oldest was, you know, she was about seven at the time. The middle kid was five. So they don't have really good memories of him. But then it, it starts, he looks like him. He acts like a dad. He warms up. He gets them to warm up to him even before she does because she knows who he is and he's a player and she knows he's a player. So kind of that through that, their relationship grows. And then what brings them together is a, a terrorist act that's going to happen right there near them and how they have to fix it. And that's how the first book starts off. And then it builds on that. And then you find out things about her, uh, her, her ops partner, her mission partner, Jack. And they have a great team and the team is their second family. And it's everybody from the tech person to the, the communications person who he and her end up getting married to, you know, I mean, it's like, there's a whole team. They have a, okay. a cleaner, somebody. So I think it's been, it's been a lot of fun to watch these people grow. And I, I think you're right. You know, every character has to grow in the book for people to stay on, especially if it's a series. Yeah. And I, that's interesting because sort of like Drew, it was, it was kind of born out of what happened to her husband that she decided I'm going to join this and, and take his place. Um, like you said, maybe a little stuck in the anger phase, but still like, here's something I can do. Jane, I forgot about that. That's how we connect. It's just yeah, so yeah. hard. Wait a minute. Yasmin has that too going yes. on. <laughs> I do. Yes. So Yasmin, so Nina, how, how does she forge her path? Well, she forges her path um, just like um, the the others, you know, something happens and um, she's kind of 
forced um, into it. Um, and it is, um, you know, something with her family. And so in the first book, um, it's told in dual timelines. It's told in her as this 14 uh, year old girl, as these, you know, this thing is happening, you know, to her village and, and she's taken out of this idyllic, you know, beautiful, loving village with a loving family. It, she starts off, you know, it's very glorious and, and beautiful um, um, in this village. And then she's thrust into, you know, this world of human trafficking and, and having, you know, these vile people just, you know, decimate and um, just blow up her life um, and put her in a situation and, and take her into um, countries that she's never been to. Um, and, and, and she's all alone. So everything that she has had has been taken from her, um, even her, her freedom. Um, even her name, because she's called so many things that she loses, you know, her name and she loses her self of sense. She loses her power. So what she is trying to get in a sense in the first book, definitely. Um, well, in the first book, it's really revenge. Um, but like she's trying to regain her power that was taken from her. And, and she does that when she, you know, meets her adoptive family um, and they, um, you know, just like the housewife, right? You know, she they have this established system, only it's not with black ops. It's, you know, um, I, I don't want to necessarily say like a criminal element, but it's, you know, kind of like along that. And they have this structure um, in the tribe where they have a, a group called um, the dispatch team. And they literally go and dispatch people that the tribe deems, you know, are against um, you know, the African people, um, the people of the African diaspora and the goals that they're having to, to really help people who are in need and things. And so they think anybody who is against them, they need to be dispatched because, or eliminated, you know, because they're not good or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. And so in order for her to get her power back, you know, she, she wasn't able to fight off the people who harmed her family and harmed her. She wasn't able to keep herself, you know, in Ghana. Um, and so what she wants the most is to be able to to never be in that position again. Um, and, and so that is what motivates her. That's what drives her in, you know, all of these stories and what she develops is, you know, I need to get to this place. And that means she's got the training just very much like the black ops. And, and she's given that question. Whereas um, Josie's character says, I want to do what my husband did, you know, um, Nina is asked, you know, what is it that's going to make you feel or, or, take you on the path to becoming whole again. And she says, I want my power back. And they say, well, this is how you might be able to do it because they know that she's angry and, and she needs to channel this rage before the rage consumes her and she becomes, you know, something bad. Um, and so that's what she is able to do. Um, and her, in her relationships that she has with her love interest and, and she's not a mother, but she has, you know, like an adoptive child, you know, a, a daughter that, or from her love interest, she has, you know, he has a child. And so she has someone that she can kind of be like a mother figure to, and it's new to her. So she's experiencing all these things um, that, you know, a woman that a person would experience for the first time in her present day timeline as an adult. And, and it's like, you know, her well had been depleted and now it's being filled back up with all these different things and life experiences while she's trying to manage being on the dispatch team and, and going out and killing people. She's having those mom experiences. She's having, you know, those, all those experiences with, with new family um, and, and a sister and parents and things like that. So, so yeah, it's like the rebirth, the rebirth of her, but it's definitely all about how does she get her power back? She's not a victim. She's a survivor. And this is how she survived. And this is what she did, you know, to survive the things that she had gone through and to not make them define who she is. She's now trying to really, you know, define who she is, how she wants to be. Yeah, that that's such a great point, too. And I think all of, I think all of your comments can go to that, that you choosing not to be a victim. Yes. You're choosing to take action, to survive and thrive. And so Yasmin, is, I, is that the title of your first book, Her Name is Night? Does, does that come from the idea that she feels like she's lost her identity and lost her whole sense of self? Is that 
Is that what the title relates to? Or yeah, the, the title is honestly an introduction to, to her um, because we see her as Anine, um, who is the 14 year old. And then we see her evolve into Nina Knight and Knight is her last name, Knight is the family. And so, um, you know, that book is like a, hello, her name is Knight, you know, um, and just letting you know, this is Nina. Um, and, and this is this woman that we're presenting to you. We're gonna let you know how she came to be, but this is her. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's all like a play on all of that. And okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and I, and I wish Lisa were here because I wanted to talk, obviously, her book, Woman on Fire, her character uh, is tasked with recovering uh, an, an art that was stolen by the Nazis some 75 years earlier. And again, it's going to be a very complex character. And the, I, I obviously wanted to talk to Lisa about the, you know, she was a journalist for many, many years. And so that tie with her character. Um, but just again, the that 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 idea of putting yourself in a in a dangerous uh, situation because there's something in you that just tells you it's the right thing to do, and that, you know this is what I'm going to do. Um, so I'm so sad that we lost Lisa, but hopefully, maybe in the future we can maybe we can do something like this again and get her back in. Um, let's talk about research because your books there's just there just must be a staggering amount of research that goes into writing the type of books that you do. And Jane, I want to start with you because with historical fiction, you must, I don't know, I'm guessing the research probably takes as long, if not longer than the actual writing of, of the book. Um, but talk a little bit about how do you go about, well, how do you approach doing research for these such complex novels? Yeah, so um, it, the research does take quite a bit of time. And I think one thing that a lot of historical fiction authors run into though is that they they love the research part like I really enjoy research but you know at some point you hit a wall like I I like to feel like I, I do enough research that I have a base and I can when it's kind of like a instinct like all of a sudden it's like okay Jane like you're now you're procrastinating it's time to like get some words on the page and actually write the book and not just like think about it and and read articles and and, and organize your research so um, I like to have like a solid base before I start writing um, but then ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm kind of also researching as I go because there are people love those little details, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like clothing and food and, and setting. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's an ongoing process, but I do, I feel much more comfortable if I have a solid base of research, notes, articles, books, primary source materials, everything before I, before I jump into the writing aspect of it. Um, and this one was tricky because she was kind of famous adjacent. She was like a B-list actress. So there wasn't a ton about her. So she wrote a small autobiography. I had some, there's some letters archived at the Holocaust Memorial Museum that I used. That was from her, that when she could write letters home before they, before mail stopped. Um, there was, you know, there's some other secondary sources. So I also, I had, you know, certain aspects of her life, I had to um, I had to find other people's perspectives for, for where and when she was. So when, um, for instance, when the refugees from Belgium were streaming into the city of Paris um, and she was involved in, in helping them, I had to read about what that was like for a lot of different people who were helping because I couldn't I, I couldn't get that much about her experience. Or mm. she was actually interned with um, several hundred American and British women um, for a, a few months during the war in the mountains of France on the German border. And um, so she, I had her perspective, but then I had to read a it, read about that experience of, of being in that prison camp um, from, you know, the British nuns that were there and Sylvia Beach, who owned Shakespeare and Company, she was also there with her. And so just so I could get a, a just a more immersive understanding of, of some of the things that she experienced and not just have it from her perspective. From her perspective, because you can tell. Do, do, you ever, do you find that, do you ever find that you put more in than you need and you have to go back and, you know, pull some out or is oh, it... Yeah. I think because I think that would be I think that would be one of the hardest things because you want you want the reader to know all these things about everything you're researching, but you don't necessarily want to lose the story. So I guess that's part of it, though. You have to go back in and go, OK, I'm going to take a little bit of this out and edit this out. Well, that's the hardest part, honestly. But I mean, one thing I always say is like the, the research and the history has to serve the story. You know, like, and and yeah. I think that's a learning curve too. My first book, I it was about these women in Boston's North End 
who wrote who made this pottery and I had like 10 pages of how the pottery was made and, and my my critique group was like nobody cares <laughs> get that down to like one paragraph and so like I think you know I've gotten better at that. I hope I've gotten better at that as I go along but um but yeah because people love the detail they love to be in the setting and in the world, but you it, you can really lose them if you offered like way too much boring detail about like, how, you know, coding or whatever, you know, whatever the topic is. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's the challenge because it's not necessarily even that it's boring, but you, it's so, it's interesting, but like you said, it has to be germane to the story. It has yeah. to keep moving the story along and otherwise yeah. you can kind of get into the weeds there. That's, yeah, that's easy mm -hmm. to do. Yasmin, how about for you, What do, what's your pro research, uh, process like? Well, um, I first of all, I have to say, Jane, I had to write down what you said, because I was like, that was a great, you know, when you said the research and the history has to serve the story. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is so true. And oh, um, yeah. I, I love that because that's, it's really, it's so true. And, um, and I also love research um, and, and have to research extensively, even though I have like an action thriller and, and she kills people. Um, and it's and it's not easy to research being an assassin. So I can't. I mean, like, you, you can't go out and nobody actually tells you that they're an assassin. So you really can't, you know, research that. Um, there's no expert um, for that subject. Um, so I have to, you know, talk to like law enforcement and you know, I uh, for fighting. I might talk to like my friend who you know does martial arts, and so I'll ask her about certain moves that I'm thinking about, and she'll like talk to talk me through and and then I'll you know maybe look it up on YouTube and, and things like that mm -hmm. um and then I you know I've you know looked I've read and and um looked up stuff you know about um uh, organized crime and and of, of like business moguls and business uh entities because you know I've got like a fusion of two and and things like that so like and like Jane said, I you can get really mired in all of that. And you can just, I have whole notebooks of like notes. And then I was like, yes, you have to finally do the damn thing. You got to write this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, but I want to know more about, you know, how did I kill this, you know, and all this other stuff, um, researching guns and things. And so why um, Jane's line that she said, you know, resonates with me is because a lot of um, action thrillers, you know, military thrillers, spy thrillers can get really technical with like the, the, the weaponry and, you know, all these things that, you know, the regular reader is not into and they just want the story. Mm -hmm. But we get all of this, you know, how they assembled the gun and, and all these different like gun parts. And I'm just like, what is all this other stuff? <laughs> so like I'm, I will in my research go through all that so that I can then pick out from that research, what yeah. serves the story? What is it that is the, that the reader needs to know, but is going to keep them moving? And that's what I try to do in my in my stories. And also, I really just don't know that much about it. And when they're talking about it, I get bored. You know, when when my friends who you know have guns and things are talking, I'm like, wah, 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 you know. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, so I try to to do the same. And it, and it's hard, but like. It's also great to have more research for me because then when I'm going through my revision stages, when where I see that things are light and, oh, there might be a little bit more context that's needed here for this thing, I can refer back to this research. Or if I don't have it, then I know, oh, now I just need to go find this one particular thing and I'll go. So research for me is layered um, and it's always evolving and it helps to feed into, you know, the, and, and, and to serve that story. But yeah, it's really hard to like stop and be like, it's time to write because I really would prefer not to write. I just research <laughs> and hopefully it just, just comes out, but it doesn't. So <laughs> that, that is a good point though. That can actually work the other way. That if you're reading what you've written and you realize a little something is missing that you can go back, okay, I have that here in my notes and everything. Uh, also interesting, Yasmin, I'm thinking, I guess you could, there could be a knock on your door one day if you're researching how to be an assassin. Like, <laughs> you know, you've got some questions to answer here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Josie, how about you? What's your, what's your research? I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, both of what uh, Jane and Yasmin say resonates with me so much. I actually have like in each of my books, I have specific research on all the things that you know, whether it be the military, how the military handles something, 
the kind, oh, I actually have a gun expert who's at my beck and call. I have someone who has been um, um, in, in, uh, in the intelligence community at my beck and call, which is nice. Cause then you can say, Hey, would this happen? How would this happen? But sometimes, you know, like even where I get my ideas, I had a, one of my books was based on something that I read where a terrorist wanted to actually implant, um, you know, explosions uh, into a woman's breast. So I had a, I have a book that was based on a plastic surgeon who nobody knew he was a terrorist and, that was something he was trying to do. And it was, you know, it's book 14, which is a terrorist TV guide. It's sort of like a housewives of Hilldale. So <laughs> a, housewife. a real housewife situation, you know, and Don and Jack are like, ugh, we have to be part of this show. How awful is that? You know, and, but they have to figure out who the terrorist is in the group. And they know it's going to happen on national television and the person wants it to happen on national television. Um, everything about the pres presidency I've researched because th throughout the series, there is situations where they have to be in front of the president. They have to, you know, there's a situation where there, we actually have a bad president who happens to be someone who is a deep, deep, um, deeply embedded Russian spy. Gee, I don't know where I got that. I do. I really don't No, But I mean, that happened that wrote, I wrote that book you know, a couple of years back and, um, you know, everything about, you know, the, the armored car that he travels in, the beast. You know, I had a situation that happens in the beast um, because it, you can't, you seriously cannot blow it up. So I do something to the beast that they didn't think about, I hope. You know, and hopefully nobody will think about it. So, um, you know, so I have to, and I'm always, my files are incredible because I do them by category. And then I move them from each book. Like even if I picked up something in book five, I'll slip it all the way to book number 20 just because I know I could use it. Like right now, you know, my next book will be, has something to do with finance because there's so much happening in finance and not just, I'm not just talking about crypto, but there's so many, so many d dirty dealings in every part of our life. I mean, whether you're talking about, you know, breaking down, you know, somebody doing terrorist against our grid, you know, our electrical grid mm -hmm. or our water supply. I mean, there's, there are ways to hurt us that, that, you know, that we don't even want to think about. And so I have to live with this and I'm doing that for all of you. I just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding all this in. <laughs> you, you've, dispelled, you've dispelled the notion that there's nothing new under the sun because a plastic surgeon <laughs> who implants explosive in women's breasts, I think that's oh. new. I've not oh, read one of them. Yeah. Um, I, I was, again, uh, I wanted to talk to Lisa. Her, Lisa's father is a, a Holocaust survivor. And so, you know, when she, it, it, that's, I think when she's doing her um, research, uh, when she was doing her research to write her book, you know, I think that, that that aspect of Holocaust history is so important to her. I was hoping we'd have a chance to hear from her about that. Um, but, you know, like all of you, the, the research is so varied, it's so complex and so different for every author. Um, I can't believe we're almost out of time, but I want to ask one more question before I, I want you all to tell everyone you know, what you're working on now, what's coming next, where we can find you in your work. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, how has the reader response been to your books? Is it what you expected? Um, you know, we always try to think we're not writing for, you know, don't think about who you're writing for, just write your story. Um, talk a little bit about the, the reader response to, to your books. Um, and we could just go around the, uh, Josie, why don't you start? You're, I'm, sure, you, I'm sure you have to get how hysterical your writing is. Um, um, I do. And people, people do love the laughs, which I'm glad because you have to lighten the situation yeah. sort yeah. of. Um, so I enjoy doing that. Um, I get people who have followed me from book one and I love my readers because of that. And what they do is they, if they, you know, they let me know that I'm on the right track, that I I'm upping my game with every book or, you know, they'll say, um, you know, once again, you know, you went off in a different direction. You, you know, I thought we were going to go here and then, you know, you surprised me. I have people that, that write me who, you know, they'll write like, uh, for example, I had somebody who actually does helicopter quality control in Great Britain who wrote me and said, here's what you got wrong about the helicopter. And I said, great, I'll fix it. And I said, can I use you as a source? You know, I have people that um, do um, airplane, you know, that are pilots and they'll say, here's something that you would need for a pilot situation. So it's all been wonderful for um, people to write in and let me know that I'm doing the right thing. And, um, and I appreciate that. 
mm -hmm. think we all do when we, and, and, and it all goes back into the next book. And you, I have archery people, I have guns people, you know, it's, it's just fabulous. I have people exactly. that are EMTs that'll say, hey, here's what would happen in that situation. Right. Or I reach out to them first and say, what would happen in that situation? So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a community. It builds, a, my book is a community of people, yeah. readers and also experts and myself. So yeah. Yes. Yasmin, how about you? What's your reader response? Anything surprising from your readers? Um, just that they like it. That's always a surprise to me, <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest. Um, and that they and that they got it. Um, that they um I really like when when they are very, very attached or angry with certain characters. And so they like to tell right. me. Um, how they feel about these characters. One of them was like, she wanted to eviscerate and pull out the insides of a particular character. And I was like, yes, you know, or if they say she cried or whatever, then I'm like, my job was done well. Um, you know, so I like those. Um, and it, it been really good responses, but the more than anything that I'm just, you know, grateful that people picked up the books um, and that they enjoy it, that they understood, you know, what I was trying to do with her um, and that they appreciate the story as it was told. Um, and also that they appreciate the um, the infusion of, you know, the my Ghanaian culture into sure. the book, which is something that, you know, they might not get very often. And so they appreciate those things. And, and part of my research was my mom, right? And so mm -hmm. since from Ghana, and so the um, when I'm using our, our language in the books and, and even like foods and things, these are foods that I've eaten or foods that are my favorite. Um, and I think at once you had asked, like, is there anything of us that's in the book? Yes. What's of me is anything that Nina really likes to eat is really what Yasmin likes to eat. That's, so, like to eat. <laughs> that's me. That's the thing that's me in the book. So so yeah. So those are the things. And then I have a lot of people who will always tell me, yeah, I'm picking up like an order of lemon pepper wings because that is Nina, aka. Yasmin's favorite <laughs> lemon pepper wings and and um, bacon cheeseburgers and so I like it when people share wings and burgers with me. It, isn't that fun? It is fun to insert just those kinds of things that are you into yeah. your, into your novels. I wasn't doing it on purpose. I was just really hungry. Yeah, it's really great <laughs> <laughs> when you're hungry. <laughs> Jane, how about do do you get a lot of um, do, do you get people saying? Hey, you nailed this, like historians, and or do you get people saying, uh, "You got there's because people do." I don't know what it's, it's just they can't help themselves. They like to point out what what you got wrong. I'm not suggesting you got anything wrong. Oh. I just mean, in general, I think that's something people like to do. So, do you get that kind of response from readers? Oh no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been doing this now for you know Saturday Mean Girls Club came out in first uh, seven years ago, and mm -hmm. um, and it's I mean it's lovely because I and like Josie said, I'm always trying to up my game. I hope each book is is the best I have ever written. You know, it's better than my last. Um, and I've become really good friends with a lot of readers over the years, book clubs, um, and that's yeah. that's amazing. But in terms of historical details, yes, of course. I mean, I've gotten a couple things wrong okay. and I have heard about it. <laughs> I, I look at that email. <laughs> so yeah. even the tiniest detail, like the year that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song came out was off by one year and yeah. I, I still get emails about that like four years later. So <laughs> well, that, you know what? That's a syndrome. I feel like those are the people who, who they go to the restaurant, they get one soggy asparagus beer, and they just well, go on Yelp and you know just annihilate the restaurant. Oh, like, yeah. that, that's a definite syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like they can't help themselves. They, they gotta let them know. <laughs> so, I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, you know, hopefully I'm I feel so terrible about leaving. Lisa, I want to, obviously you can follow Lisa, um, Lisa Barr, you can go to her website. Um, her book, Woman on Fire, is being made into, I believe, a movie with Sharon Stone. Ah, so we wanted to definitely talk to her about that. Um, so, you know, please, please uh, go and, and read all you can about Lisa and her work, and we'll follow her and, and look for Woman on Fire. So tell us what's going on. You've got things that are optioned for TV. You've got books just coming out. Uh, tell us uh, where we can, where readers can find you. What, what, you know, what you're working on now, um, Jane. Why don't you go ahead and start? 
Well, um, first, my books have not been optioned, but I want some of the juju from all of you people. So I'm hoping oh, that, you know, I'm okay. you that <laughs> now that I'm here with you. Um, but no, I um, I, I can be reached janehealy.com, at Healy Jane on Instagram. I'm mostly on Instagram these days in terms of social media. If you sign up for my mailing list, you'll get invitations to my monthly historical happy hours, they're live webinars, but then I can, I convert them to pot. Well, my husband converts them to podcasts and YouTube videos. Um, and yes, I'm working on a new project that I hope to be able to talk about um, soon. But I, speaking of Juju, I'm like superstitious until I feel like it's like a thing. So, um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I, yes. I, I, I think that's good. I do the same thing as you do. I think, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine someone wanting my little book to be you yeah. know, on TV. Or I think that must just be unreal so okay. Josie, i mean i can't i can't imagine so josie what are you I, what what are you could you possibly be working on you're gonna write you're gonna stop at what 500 600 books what do you think i hope i live that long um <laughs> the um uh you can find me at josiebrown.com just like my name um right i will be in about a month uh releasing the latest of the housewife assassin series which is called gambit and it takes her all over the world she's uh uh, she's looking for someone who has essentially co-opted all the intelligence community directories. So he, sh this person has them from every country. Uh, you know, like they've got Russia's, but they've also got ours. They've got France's, but they got the UK. Um, they've got um, China's and North Korea's. So it's kind of fun because she gets to see uh, you know, everybody has to bid on their own um, directory, but they also have people bidding against them. So that's been a that's been a fun thing. So I, and it allows me to do my, um, you know, my armchair world world around the world travel. And I actually do um, I go into Google Earth like I actually went into Estonia and then I had to go into Russia. And, the only, and I can't believe it. I got into Russia with Google Earth and was able to check something out that I needed to check out to make it yeah. authentic. So anyway, so um, Gambit will be released on um, last week in June. So be looking for that. And, um, um, you know, I've had very good luck in, in having things that have been optioned and people that have been interested. And it's gone all the way to, you know, being approved and then not, you know, to pilot. One went to pilot, which was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. But um, if they don't air the pilot, you don't get the money. So, I mean, you get some money along the way. So it's always a fun thing. I all feel that everything that, that any, all of us have written and I've read all of you. So I can honestly say that, yeah, Hey, let's, let's all go to the movies when it happens or the, yeah. watch it or let's stream it together. And that would be fun. Too. Yeah. So that'd be so, so fun. That's awesome. That's screaming awesome. parties for whoever Yay. gets there first. We're there with you girls. Love so, that. Yeah. Yes, man. What are you, where can we find you? What are you working on? Yeah. I know your, your next book is coming out in September. My next book, um, One in Yellow, It Ends With Night, comes out in September. Um, so gearing up to do um, the, the promos and you know publicity on that. Um, you can find me at yasminongo.com. And I'm on IG as well at um, author underscore Yaz or Twitter at Yaz A Writer. And so... Um, you shoot me an, an email, a nice email, um, I'll, you know, reply back and, and you know, okay. we'll be friends. Um, and what I'm working on very much like Jane, I'm superstitious. And so it's in my head, um, my fourth book that's coming out. And so it'll be a standalone is what I can tell you, but I still have some bits and pieces to iron out. So I really don't like, you know, want to talk about it too much because it's going to sound horrible when I speak on it um, and, and everything like that. And then, um, and then yes, um, the the trilogy um, has been optioned by um, the same people who um, created um, Killing Eve um, wow. and things like that. So we just hope that you know it That's goes it. through, like Josie said, and we can maybe have we have a streaming party or whatever. But I mean that that's just a blessing. So I'm just happy for however far it's come so far. Um, and, you know, I just never imagined it. So, yeah, that's what I've got going on. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. I, I, I could talk another hour. This has been great. You guys are all wonderful. I'm so happy that you joined us today. We are definitely all going to be checking out your work and rooting for you. Um, and I just want to tell you what a pleasure this was. And so nice to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you for having me. Thank Lee, you. always a pleasure. 
Always a pleasure, Josie. <laughs> Have a great day.